first scripture this morning is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 84. May the word of God speak to us all. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength, till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. The New Testament lesson is from the book of Luke, chapter 10. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The word of God for the people of God. <clears throat> These verses from Luke this morning are perhaps one of the most familiar passages in the Bible. Even those who do not spend a great deal of time in the word recognize this passage the story of the compassionate Samaritan. These words from Jesus were spoken as a parable. And I may have told you before, when I was growing up, I, was, I taught that parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Today, we might refer to it as one of Jesus' teachable moments. A parable reveals the character of God, what he is like, how he works, and what he expects from his followers. In this story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus teaches us how to love the outcasts of the world. This road from Jericho to Jerusalem, the road where this parable takes place, was 18 miles long, descending over 3,000 feet, running through rugged mountains with deep caves and stony overlooks. It was common for travelers at that time to find themselves under attack from bandits and thieves living in the mountains and caves. One of those travelers found themselves in this situation, beaten, 
robbed of his belongings, and left half dead. Two Jewish leaders, a priest and a Levite, who was just lower than a priest, each come upon the beaten man. They look and they see the man in need, but they turn and they walk down the other side of the road. Two men who could have helped, who probably would be expected to help, intentionally avoided the hurting man by walking on the other side of the road and continuing on their journey. Maybe they thought it was too risky to stop. What if the man was faking his injuries and he would attack them? Perhaps their concern was about impurity from contact with a half-dead person. Or maybe they thought they were too busy to stop. They had places to go, people to see, things to do. All of the men in this story are Jews. Jesus is a Jew. The lawyer and religious leaders are Jews. Those listening to the parable from Jesus are certainly Jews. The injured man and most likely the robbers were Jews. A Samaritan who was hated by the Jews passes by. The Jews would never use good and Samaritan in the same sentence. The hated Samaritan sees the man in need. He risks his life. He stops. He tends to the man's wounds. And he takes him to the inn and pays for him to be cared for until he returns. He did all that he was capable of doing. He didn't just stop the bleeding, bandage his, bandage his wounds, and leave him. In verse 36, when Jesus asked the lawyer, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? The lawyer likely found it very difficult to say the words, the Samaritan. Instead, he mumbled, the one who had mercy on him. And what did Jesus say? You go and do the same. When a lawyer wants to know how to inherit eternal life, Jesus tells him to love the Lord God with his whole being, his heart, his soul, his strength, his mind, and love his neighbor as himself. This learned man says, who is my neighbor? That is our question to ponder this morning. Who is my neighbor? I live on a road that is about five miles long. I've lived on that road most all of my life. And we always considered that anyone that lived along that five mile stretch was our neighbor. That's not how Jesus wants us to think about our neighbors. I believe that Jesus is saying that anyone who is in need is our neighbor. Whether they live next door or on the other side of the world, whether they are our friends or those that we have never met, whether we don't always agree with their lifestyle or whether they live their lives just as we. According to Jesus, if they are in need, they are our neighbors. Author Trish Warren suggests that in the Good Samaritan parable, the beaten man is Adam. The Good Samaritan is Jesus. And the innkeeper is the church. Let me say that again. The beaten man is Adam. The Good Samaritan is Jesus. And the innkeeper is is the church. If that is the case, what neighbors might Jesus be bringing to us? The church, the innkeepers. Jesus has said to us, here church, I'm going away for a while. These are my people. I love them. I have forgiven them. I have shown mercy to them. I have taught them. Please do the same until I return. And please tell them that I love them so much that I have died on a cross for them. 
so that they may spend eternity with me. Jesus spurs us as individuals and as a church to take action, to serve those on the margins. We are not to have the attitude, but Jesus, I have places to go, things to do, people to see. I am not capable of being your innkeeper. Psalm 32, eight reads, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will give counsel to you and watch over you. So what do Jesus' people look like? Those that he's bringing to the inn at the church of Marion, who are in need. Who are they? They're the lonely, the hungry, the recently widowed, the single mom, the wealthy self-made entrepreneur who feels empty and disillusioned, the five-year-old whose family is unchurched, who comes to vacation Bible school and hears about Jesus for the first time. It is those from family promise that you are ministering to, to the homeless heroes, to the children on the other side of the world that you are showing Jesus love through Operation Christmas Child. The inn, or church, that I attend sits right along the Crooked Creek on the edge of Indiana County. The little town of Shalokta sits just on the other side of the creek. As innkeepers at the Shalokta Inn, who do we believe are our neighbors? Those that Jesus is bringing to us. We believe that Jesus has asked us to consider those living across the bridge in Shalokta, as well as those living across the oceans in Rwanda, where our sister church, Kira A, is located, as our neighbors. He wants us to love them, care for them, teach them, forgive them, show mercy to them, and tell them about the depth of his love for them. As I was preparing this message, I was reminded of times that I witnessed compassion-loving innkeepers answering God's call, and I would like to share a couple of those with you. Being compassionate and showing mercy often comes with a cost. It costs the Samaritan his time, his money, his safety. Showing mercy often means sacrificing ourselves. I once knew a woman, I don't remember her name, but her daughter's name was Debbie. So I'm going to call her Debbie's mom. Debbie and my son Brian were in the same kindergarten class back in the mid 70s. Debbie's mom, another mom and I were asked to organize a Valentine's Day party for the class. The three of us met one morning in Debbie's mom's kitchen. Debbie's little brother played on the floor on a blanket while we did our planning. And we were there about an hour or so when a truck pulled up out front and the doorbell rang. It seemed as though Debbie's mom was expecting someone. And she went to the door and in walked a man that I recognized from one of the local churches in Indiana and a young Vietnamese couple. This was during the time the Vietnam refugees were being brought to Indiana. They walked out into the next room and they came back with a real pretty overstuffed living room chair that they were carrying. They took it out and they loaded it onto the truck and they drove off. When Debbie's mom came back into the kitchen, the other mom with some surprise said, did you give them that chair? Debbie's mom said, yes. The other mom said, why would you do that? You don't even know them. Debbie's mom said, why should I have two chairs when they have none? Remind you of Luke 3.11, if you have two coats, give one to someone who doesn't have. And anyone who has food, you should do the same. 
I was witnessing Luke 3.11 lived out in that kitchen that morning. Debbie's mom, the innkeeper, was showing to us what compassion to those in need looked like. A few years ago, I attended a global prayer gathering in Washington, D.C. with my daughter. The 1,600 that were gathered there came to hear what prayers had been answered and what prayers needed to continue with the IJM ministry, International Justice Mission. IJM is an organization that fights injustice in third world countries, mostly injustice of children, young children. We met and heard of boys as young as four in Ghana who were denied an education and made to live and work on fishing boats in inhumane conditions. We met a girl from Rwanda who at age 12 was forced into sex trafficking, whose abusers left her to die in a burning house. She was rescued by IJM and given a new life. The stories were heart-wrenching and very difficult to hear. But I left encouraged because I met young people, trained social workers, lawyers, therapists, who were giving up lucrative jobs to live in faraway, dangerous places, doing dangerous work, answering God's call to be compassionate innkeepers. God is not always calling us to give away our possessions and travel to distant places to work as an innkeeper. Someone who was a friend of my parents was on my mind recently. She lives alone and was getting up in years, and I was told that she doesn't get much company. She's not able to attend church any longer. I had been praying for her, that God would be with her, and that she wouldn't be lonely. After I had been praying this prayer for Mary Jane for a short time, I felt a holy nudge telling me, Donna, I am with her. How about you make a pan of brownies and go visit her? I will go with you. I did what God asked and found, as what usually happens when we do God's work, that I left feeling blessed, just as much as she said she was blessed. Being a good innkeeper in our world can be overwhelming. I know it feels that way for me. The needs of God's people are many, and the time and the resources limited. We can't do the work that God has called us to do on our own. It is not possible. But he has promised to guide us, teach us, and watch over us as we do the work that he has called us to do. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a simple recipe or a job description on how to be God's innkeeper? There is. You take a big bowl, you pour in our weaknesses, we add his strength, we stir and serve. Amen. Thank you for letting us share our worship service with you today. We invite you to join us in person next Sunday at 1030, or if you prefer to listen online Sunday afternoon. If you would like to make a donation, please visit our website at www.marionpress.org and click the Donate Now button. May God bless you and have a great week.